Thank professor Weissman, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to stand up because I'm a professor and I'm used to standing up. Uh, She's a young professor. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk to you about a very different type of data that I've been gathering, very different data from what we've, you've seen the rest of the day, and that is simply the content of regulations. Since 2008, when I began working at the University of Texas, I've been attempting to collect data on just the content of regulations in approximately 16 different states in most of the shale formations uh, to determine simply uh, how states are approaching the issue of shale gas. I've also been collecting data on the violations at well sites that have involved hydraulic fracturing. And I've attempted to identify regulations at almost every stage of the well development process, so I'm actually won't talk much about hydraulic fracturing at all today. Uh, everything from seismic testing to construction of the well site, drilling casing, cementing the well, storing waste in surface pits, disposing of them in underground injection control wells or through wastewater treatment plants, and then also just storing and disposing of flowback water in particular. So in 10 minutes, I'll tell you all about those 16 different states. Here we go. Uh, we're primarily at the state level for several reasons. There are important federal regulations that apply to fracturing. I'll discuss them. Uh, but, but there are certain federal exemptions. And for the federal regulations that do apply, states typically implement them. So the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is a very important federal regulation with respect to underground injection control disposal wells, like we heard about in Ohio, states typically implement the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act standards. It's something we call cooperative federalism uh, in legal terms. And then we also have some regional uh, regulatory bodies that are important, especially in the Marcellus region. Uh, Susquehanna and Delaware River Basin Commissions are increasingly active in regulating shale gas development, or at least trying to. And then local governments, as Professor John Nolan will discuss, are also increasingly involved, although in some cases states are trying to preempt uh, local regulation. But states are at the center of all of this. Again, this is in part because of a few exemptions. That's a politically lo loaded term. I don't intend it that way. It's simply that in the past, uh, Congress has determined that uh, certain aspects of federal statutes and EPA implementation of the statutes through regulation shouldn't apply to oil and gas. One of the big exemptions is RICRA, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which applies to uh, waste, the handling of waste from cradle to grave. Subtitle C of that act, which applies to hazardous waste, uh, does not address m many exploration and production wastes from oil and gas. So the states are primarily responsible for those wastes. Uh, we also have the actual injection of water and chemicals down the well. That's a very small phase of a much larger process. But the injection of water and chemicals down the well, the actual hydraulic fracturing, is not regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act, although fracturing with diesel is. And the EPA has just uh, developed guidelines for fracturing with diesel. Uh, we have some imp very important federal laws that do apply. Again, the Safe Drinking Water Act governs the safety of underground injection control wells that accept produced waters and flowback waters uh, from many drilled and fractured wells. We also have new uh, Clean Air Act standards coming in for the volatile organic compounds that are emitted from the flowback water. By approximately January 1, 2015, uh, operators will essentially have to capture those VOCs and send them through a pipeline rather than uh, letting them out into the air. I mentioned the diesel fuel fracturing standards. The Endangered Species Act and Migratory Bird Treaties Act, also very important. A lot of oil and gas attorneys spend their time trying to figure out how to prevent golden eagles from roosting on rigs, uh, as well as keeping birds out of surface pits. There have been some interesting uh, prosecutions recently in the Bakken Shale by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, dead ducks were found in the surface reserve pits. Uh, a federal court, however, said that there was not a, a direct killing of the ducks by the oil and gas company in the Bakken, so uh, the prosecutions were reversed. But Texas, the federal courts in Texas disagree with that determination. Stormwater permits, we've talked a little bit about sediment and erosion. Uh, when an oil or, or gas site is constructed, the operator must obtain a federal Clean Water Act permit. Uh, it's called a stormwater NIPTES permit, typically state implemented. 
Uh, and then finally, the EPA is developing clean pretreatment standards for flowback and other liquid waste sent from shale gas wells to wastewater treatment plants. But the states are the most important, and let me just briefly go through uh, some of the major stages of well development and give you a few examples from the states. Uh, various states are, uh, have attempted to essentially regulate nuisances associated with uh, shot holes or the vibrosize operations, a thumper buggy or some other equipment hits the ground to create the vibrations that we heard about earlier today. Uh, and essentially, you want to separate those operations from houses, in some cases from water, water wells. This Colorado regulation is for a shot hole. You basically have to fill in a shot hole if you dynamite the hole, and you have to rake around it, uh, basically restore the site uh, to its previous con condition. Uh, Maryland uh, might even deny a vibro size permit or a shot hole, hole permit if it could substantially uh, damage the environment. And someone asked about cutting of trees earlier. Arkansas actually prevents the cutting of trees for vibrosize or shot hole operations, trees that are six inches or more in diameter. Uh, in terms of uh, building the access road and the well site, um, very interesting requirements for setting back well sites from various protected resources. This is one of the best ways to prevent contamination, especially if an accidental surface spill occurs. Colorado has these buffer zones uh, in which only limited uh, oil and gas drilling or fracturing activities may occur around water supplies, uh, and they have various controls required within those buffer zones. Uh, examples of other setbacks, I'd say Texas has been uh, the least aggressive on the, on the setback front. It basically only requires the setting back of a well from houses. But in other states, you see uh, requirements for separating wells from public water supplies, streams, wetlands, and the like. A lot of discussion about baseline testing today. Colorado just came out with a new regulation. Uh, environmental groups have criticized it because it actually caps the number of wells and water sources that may be tested before oil and gas drilling occurs, but it does require baseline testing. <laughs> Pennsylvania and West Virginia have a very interesting provision, a rebuttable presumption that the contamination of water within a certain distance of an oil or gas site was caused by the oil or gas operation. What does that do? Strongly incentivizes baseline testing by the company, right? Because if there's going to be a rebuttable presumption, the company wants some way to rebut the assertion that water was contaminated. Uh, Pennsylvania has recently expanded that presumption. Uh, Ohio, as mentioned, requires baseline testing within 1,500 feet of unconventional wells. Uh, and it has interesting requirements for uh, whether the testing must occur sort of down gradient of the oil or, or gas site. Michigan also requires a hydrogeological investigation within 1,300 feet. But many states don't require any baseline testing. Casing uh, has been mentioned that every state requires surface casing. This is an incredibly important part of the well development process. The depths of the casing required, the depths of the surface casing below groundwater vary a bit. Uh, for example, from 30 feet to 100 feet. Uh, many states require that the piping used for the, the casing be new or that if it is used and thus could potentially be compromised, it must be tested to show that the casing will be adequate. Uh, so other states appear to allow just used casing. They don't specify. Uh, so Ohio, for example, just says steel production casing. Oklahoma said, says oil field grade steel casing. And moving quickly onward, onward, cementing, this first bullet is a little bit compressed. There are two separate regulations for cementing. One is that the cement must reach a compressive strength in a certain time. Another is that the cement must stand for a certain amount of time before testing or other interruption of the well occurs. That ensures that the cement with, between the casing and the well bore will set properly. And I assume I'm running out of time, so let me just tell you there, there are lots of different regulations in states, although uh, increasingly I think we're starting to see uniformity. States are changing some of their regulations as they're looking at approaches elsewhere. Uh, water withdrawals for fracturing, some states require permits and uh, a promise that the in-stream flow levels will not be affected. 
Most states require liners and pits. Some states have very good secondary containment requirements for pits and tanks so that if something spills, uh, a liner or some, something else underneath a tank or pit will prevent the spill from going off site. And then finally, um, Ohio has revised its underground injection control uh, well requirements in response to the uh, potential earthquakes that have occurred around the disposal wells it's requiring monitoring. All right, some, some gaps remain, however, in my brief 10-minute uh, exploration. I can't really do justice to this. As I mentioned, though, states like Texas don't really have many setback requirements. Casing, casing is required in every state, but uh, organizations such, such as the State Review of Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Re Regulations, Stronger, which is uh, an IOGCC group, uh, have suggested that some state casing standards need to be updated in light of uh, fracturing, increasing pressure on wells. Uh, and with that, I will leave it to Professor Nolan to discuss the local impacts uh, and to Rich. Thank you.